Genesis in chapter number 39. It's a country back to the house of the Lord. It's always a treat to uh, be from Iran. Thank you. Isaiah. And uh, appreciate him. You know, I'm the Lord as he does. Every time I'm where he's at, I like it.
number 19. We'll notice this emphasis of his being a servant through the term that are there. Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. Well, we hit that last night. Still moving around in my heart. If you don't mind being handled, y'all will turn that around and let you handle something like Which was brought to, which had brought him down to the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master. See that term there? The Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. There's another term. He made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. It came to pass from time to time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. He left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, I with me. But he refused and said unto his master, Behold, my master wanted not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment and saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. It came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. She called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us, and he came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. It came to pass when he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried, but he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. She spake unto him according to these words, saying, the Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me. And his wrath was kindled. Joseph's master took him put him into the prison place where the king's prisoners were bound and he was there in the prison. You can be seated. Joseph is a servant, but I'd like to add a little phrase to that because that he is brought and he is purchased in this text. And there seems to be some wheeling and dealing in other places. I'd like to emphasize that he was a real heart. He's a servant that is purchased, but he was well worth the price. We might in the beginning make that application to your heart and to my heart. Are you worth the steps that that dear lady had to make down the aisle to marry you? Uh, are you worth uh, the money 
investment that your parents are putting into raising you? Uh, are you worth what you're making on the job? I'd just like to ask you, uh, is there anything about you that would please the Father because he purchased you on the cross of Calvary? And you were worthy of that calling. You walked worthy of that calling. I want us to notice Joseph. There are three things that I'd emphasize about this, this bargain of this servant. I would point out to you, first of all, that there is a bargain in his cost. A bargain in his cost. We all realize that sometimes we get hoodoo when we buy things. Uh, maybe, uh, as my grandson said, as he was in one of these little game rooms, they, you, you win the tickets and then you, you know how that goes and you go get that cheap stuff. He couldn't get it to operate. He's about seven or eight years old. He said, Daddy, Daddy, they ripped me off. He felt like he'd been done wrong. And certainly there is that, uh, that possibility buying or purchasing something that is not really worth what you pay for. Uh, in the life, at times, we like to go to yard sales and flea markets and things of that nature. And I can remember many years ago, we were in Ohio, and we come upon this, this uh, yard sale, garage sale. And right in the midst of all the stuff that was there was a bowling ball. Well, we never bowled probably two or three times in our marriage, but, I mean, you can't pass that up. I mean, <laughs> it had a price of $3, and she put her hand, put her fingers in it, and it just, just fit her, just right. I said, we, we're going to buy that, and we did. We took it home, and we had a little shed that we put our excess stuff in, you know, that you just didn't use every day. And of course, it didn't qualify for everyday use. And we put it in there. Three years later, we had our own yard sale. <laughs> and believe it or not, we pulled that bowling ball out of there and put it on the table. It stayed all day long. It was the last thing we sold. And we got a dollar out of it. <laughs> it was not a very good deal. I heard about a Mexican down on the border had a horse for sale. A fellow came by, a farmer, and he he saw the horse and it had a cheap price on it. He said, uh, man, I, 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 how come the price is so cheap? He said, uh, what's wrong with that, with that horse? He said, nothing. He just don't look so good. He sort of looks good to me, so he bought it. Took him home and tried to fly out with him. He couldn't stay in the road. He was running into the fences. And pretty soon he figured out he was blind. <laughs> So we took the horse back to the, the Mexican. He said, man, you sold me a blind horse. He said, I'll tell you, he don't look so good. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our things are not really bargains. Yeah. <laughs> and especially when you're dealing with people, you just wonder if it's worth what you're putting into it, the energy to, to hang around folks like that or to try to help folks like that or, or to invest in folks like that. And I'm sure that there were many, many uh, slaves that came through and uh, were bartered for uh, before Joseph ever got there. And they would gotten some bad ones and some rotten ones and so on. But on this day, Joseph was brought and he was set up at the market to be sold. I cannot tell you what kind of price that Potiphar paid for him. I, I do know that uh, the Ishmaelites paid 20 pieces of silver. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm sure they wanted to make a buck or two, so they might have up to, to 25, 30, 35, 40. I really don't know what they gave for this probably teenage boy. But as a result of what I have read to you in verse number 14 down through verse number 24, I want to say to you, whatever he paid for him, it was a real deal. It was a real deal because of three things. One, it was a real deal because he was a goodly person. Did you notice 
us what the scripture said about him concerning his spirit and his service and, and uh, the, the kind of man that he was, the Bible said, and uses the term, said Joseph was a, was a goodly man. He was a goodly man. Now this is in spite of all of the harshness of the conflict and misuse and abuse of his life. Uh, his altitude has changed. He was up there as a son. Number one in the eyes of his father. And now he's down there in Egypt. He has, he has descended a far, far cry. But I want to say to you, his altitude did not change his attitude. He was a blessing at the father's house. He was a blessing at Potiphar's house. He is a goodly person. He is one that the scripture said that, that he prospered the house of his master. There was a blessing in the house of his master. You can just imagine it. It seemed as though that everywhere Joseph went, that whatever was being done there, the whole atmosphere changed. And he seemed to influence the spirit of the people. He seemed to influence the outcome of the product or the crop. You just had to say that if Joseph had anything to do with it, uh, it was good. It was good. Now, uh, he could have taken a different route. He could have argued and he could have said, you know what, I, I'm a son and I'm not a servant. I've been done an injustice here and I'll just tell you right now, I'm not, I'm not lowering myself to bowing and and uh, to serving and to being a slave. I'm far above that. But somehow he was able to grasp early on because we understand it by his later statements as we'll notice that, that God was in the business of his life not only as being a son but as being a servant. And it involved a measure of humbling and humility. It's not bad when God <laughs> let you down. It's not bad when God adjusts your altitude. Because what he's wanting to do is allow you to serve him with the same spirit no matter where you're at. Amen. To be a blessing on the job when the pay is high. To be a blessing when it is low. Amen. To be a blessing in the home when everybody lets you have your way. And to be a blessing when you can't get your way. To be a blessing when things seem to be up and to be a blessing when things seem to be down. Aren't you glad for the saints that you cross paths with that it seems as though that they are determined to be a blessing no matter what the situation is. Amen. He, is a, he is a goodly person. He is a blessing. You say this and I'll move on. You know, a lot of folks say, jump around from church to church and they'll say this, I just want to go to where I can get a blessing. And I, I'm not going to scorn that. That's alright. I think you ought to go looking for a blessing. But I really think even further than that, you ought to go somewhere where God can make you a blessing. Right. You ought to be a blessing in this church. 